Well, welcome everyone to our real estate roundtable. Our look, our monthly look at housing markets in Toronto and Vancouver. In Toronto, we have John Pasalis of Velocity Realty. And Steve Soretsky joins us of Open Realty in Vancouver. How are you guys doing? Doing well. Thanks for uh, putting this together as always. <laughs> well, I know we're enjoying our summers, but Steve, I think you had a slightly busier month than normal for non-real estate uh, reasons. Last yeah, month? yeah, yeah. Markets, markets been super slow, so I decided to get married, and uh, <laughs> yeah, we tied the knot after a long uh, COVID delayed us a few years. So um, yeah, happy to kind of get that in the works, and then uh, going to Italy for a honeymoon in September. So um, we'll kind of plan that. We'll do next show will be live from uh, Florence. Oh my! Oh, gorgeous. <laughs> well, congratulations. That sounds awesome. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. That's great. So let's start. Uh, maybe this uh, this roundtable will start with you, John, in Toronto. Um, what is the latest happening in the market? I just want to uh, refer to a tweet that you uh, you had sent out a couple of days ago. That um, while you know the the story of falling sales and prices continues in the Greater Toronto Area, you released a, a stat about investors accounting for about twenty five percent of all the sales at the peak of the market. And that they're pulling out of the market is one of the big stories in the GTA in terms of uh, being behind some of the slowdown. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, that's a uh, hundred percent correct. I mean, when we think about the market, I mean, sales are down significantly. I think we're probably down about forty-five percent over last year, um, especially for low rise. And yeah, I mean, investors were making about a quarter of sales, and they're pretty much out of the market. I mean, there are very few investors buying homes right now. Uh, which has pulled a lot of demand out of the market. It's mainly end users. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're the basically the trends are kind of a continuation effectively, like slumping sales, slumping prices, uh, low rise homes. So like semis detached, they're actually down. Prices are actually now down last in July, year over year, like about one or 2%, which is the first time that's happened. Uh, condo prices are still up a little bit, so they're not falling as much, but inventory is climbing a lot more rapidly for condominiums. But it's the low rise that's hammered the most, detached homes, suburban homes, where we're seeing kind of the, the slowest sales and the biggest price declines. And what's the story on listings, John? Are you continuing to see, uh, you know, that plateau in, in for uh, people actually putting their homes on the market or is that number starting to increase? No, it's not. I mean, that's the interesting trend. We're not seeing this rush of people selling homes. Um, it's pretty balanced. And in some ways, not. it's not a crazy volume of listings, which again, like I think we talked about last month, it's kind of the opposite trend that we would expect. Like most people, when they see prices falling, rush to list their home to avoid further price declines. But we're not seeing that right now. It's pretty steady. Interesting. And out there in Vancouver, Steve, um, I, I captured one of your tweets from a few days ago here. Greater Toronto, uh, sorry, Greater Vancouver. Oh, that Toronto bias comes in. <laughs> greater Vancouver home sales are po uh, posed to hit a 20 year low this month. And that's not adjusting for the increase in population or housing stock either. So can you take us through that? And again, it seems like a continuation of what you were seeing last month. Yeah, I mean, we've we kind of talked about these numbers. Like, I think we've talked about it a few times on the show, like John and I have highlighted it before, which is like, Again, this is like very much predictable. It was like, all we had to do is, you know, we can, it's very hard to predict like markets, but all we can say is like, well, if we take interest rates or mortgage rates to a certain percentage, which I always said, hey, like once you get north of three and a half percent, we're gonna have issues. And obviously we're, we're well above that now. And, and cause we saw us in 2018, right? And so we're looking at it again. Um, that, you know, we had a, this is the, fewest amount of home sales for the month of July since July of 2000. So it's actually a 22 year low uh, in greater Vancouver home sales. And that's even worse in the Fraser Valley. I think it was also, I think it was the fewest in, since 2000 as well in the Fraser Valley, but the Fraser Valley has grown tremendously, right? The population growth, the housing stock growth. So just to kind of see uh, really how weak the market is, I mean, Again, this you have to keep in mind. This is worse than you know 08, 09 in terms of sales volumes, right? So, I mean, I think that it's just really telling that the housing market is choking uh, on on these higher interest rates. And um, so, yeah, I think to similar to John's point, the trends in Vancouver sim 
tend to be very similar to what's happening in the GTA. We're seeing more weakness in the suburbs, more weakness for the stuff that went up the most, which is entry level single family houses, followed next by the townhouse market. And then of course the, the apartment market, which is always a lagging indicator uh, is, is, is also now following suit as well. And I suspect that uh, we'll see further weakness in, in all three segments. Yeah, so we have some great uh, questions actually that are you know more specific about those segments. So we'll get into that later. So now it's time for our, our monthly ritual. So we'll talk about Bank of uh, Canada interest rate rises. When we spoke last month, we were, uh, I think many were thinking, and think including both of you, uh, that um, a 75 basis point increase was likely. Uh, and that would be a huge one. Instead, um, we have what many were calling a, a monster hike, beyond monster hike, to 100 basis points increase. So um, given where we're going, what do you think will happen in rates, uh, with rates in September? And how is this impacting the market now? And, and what do you guys see for the fall market? I don't know who wants to start. John, John, you take it. <laughs> I was going to hand it to you. <laughs> um, I'll go after you. All know. right. Well, I mean, yeah, certainly, certainly that was a, a bit unexpected, I think, on the ground. I mean, obviously, I think everyone's expecting a hike uh, in September. Um, you know, I don't know what, I, I don't know what the market's priced in, like what, 50 basis points or something like that, at least, I would think. Um, but, you know, again, I, I don't, I don't know if that's going to have a massive impact i think i think it's kind of in some ways priced in already like the market is so slow i mean the things that i'm seeing on the ground right now which are interesting are is kind of like demand interestingly starting to pick up for the fall market which is a normal trend like it's a seasonal trend everyone hits pause june july august um but this year we honestly didn't know i mean is it actually going to pick up like is are people going to return to the market and we're starting to see that like we're starting to see people more interested in, in starting to look for homes in September. So I think we'll see a slight increase uh, in, in activity and buyer demand in September, which is a natural seasonal trend. But I don't think we're returning to a, an overly busy market anytime soon. But I think I think this fall market will be a little bit busier than it is today, for sure. Steve, what are you thinking with the rates and, and what's uh, in store? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I think that I said it on the Looney Hour, which is our podcast um, outside of the show, which says, I think that the bank in Canada, just a, a guess, again, could be wrong. Uh, I think 50 basis points in September. And I think done. Um, that's my view. I think for this rate hiking cycle, I just think like, again, which we, what we talked about before, right. Is that I don't think the economy is responding well uh, to these interest rate hikes. And at some point we're gonna stop talking about inflation and start talking about recession, which I think is the narrative is starting to shift. Um, so I think we've got another rate hike coming. I think that September I'm gonna say is probably uh, last one and done, but I think we're getting extremely close. And I think the bond market is, is certainly agreeing with that. Um, you know, you're seeing obviously yields coming off lower based on the premise of weaker growth ahead. I think the markets are already pricing and I mean, obviously the U.S. had back to back uh, declines in, in quarterly GDP there. So, you know, a technical recession, so to speak. But I mean, the Canada five year bond yield, which is really probably the most important metric in Canada, you know, has fallen 100 basis points since peaking last June. Again, so I know everybody likes to pro prognosticate on, on what's going to happen and, and everybody is convinced that they know the answer but i don't think there's a whole lot of people that saw you know the beginning of let's say the end of last year if we said hey listen guys the beginning of the year you know mortgage rates are going to go from you know two percent to five percent in three months and then all of a sudden you're gonna have a hundred basis point move because every everyone in june was saying you know the canada five-year bond which was what was that 3.6 was going to go to four five, six, seven percent, everyone's going to default on mortgages, all of a sudden it's down 100 basis points. So I think it's extremely difficult in, in this environment to start to try to predict rates. Um, I just think that the typical reaction function from central bankers in the past has been when growth slows, when, re when a recession is, is clearly in front of you, that they tend to at least hit pause, I'm not calling for rate cuts. But so uh, that's that's my view. We'll see. Could be wrong, but that's my view. And what are you seeing in terms of how that's impacting with uh, consumers in Vancouver? Are you seeing, like, as John was saying, you know, uh, is 
is this all being absorbed? And now some people may start to, you know, uh, get interested again in the market in September, or are you seeing people still really holding back? Uh, I think people are still like, everyone's just like, well, you know, I could give one more month, one more month, prices will keep coming down one more month. So everyone's like, there's zero urgency whatsoever to, to, to purchase real estate. And like I said, I mean, you know, a 22 year low on home sales. I mean, you have to think of like, what's the knock on effect of that, John? I mean, like yeah. you've got, uh, I mean, did everyone just forget like, you know, okay. So you've got, you know, okay, well the contractors, you're probably not doing a lot, lot of home renovations, new housing starts, furniture sales and all the, the economic knock on effects when your two major housing markets in Canada, Vancouver and Toronto are basically at a standstill. There's almost nothing happening. So I just think like the economic ramifications of that, I just think like we're going to be talking less about inflation moving forward and more about, you know, um, you know, recessions and job freezing and layoffs and stuff, which I think was already happening, but. Yeah. And all right. I, I agree a hundred percent with Steve. I think that's the most likely trend kind of moving into the fall market at, at the end of the day, man, like the, the, a lot of our economy is driven by housing, not just retail housing, pre-construction housing, that's slowing down. Um, and, and Steve's right. I mean, I think, I think we're probably done in September with rate hikes. And at some point next year, we're probably going to be seeing, you know, probably the, the bank and the federal government a little bit more concerned about a recession than, uh, than inflation, if inflation's actually peaked, which, I mean, a lot of people think it has and probably has, but we'll see. I just think like, right. it's kind of like, everyone's kind of like so stuck on that narrative, right? Like I, I was in the inflation camp, I was early and people were getting like mad at me back in the, you know, 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been firmly in the inflation camp, but I actually think like, I think we're going towards sort of disinflation and that's not to say inflation to come back down to 2%. I don't think the bank of Canada is getting anywhere close to 2% in the, in the near term. But uh, I just think that the inflation story is starting to get stale. So given how tricky it is to, to uh, predict where all of that will go, uh, let's move to something really easy. How low will home prices go? John, you recently uh, released a, a video in which you, uh, oh. you were, <laughs> you're quite doubtful about uh, all experts' ability to actually, uh, to, you know, you, you said quite frankly, I think no one really knows. Yeah. Is that, is that right? <laughs> um, in a recent article in the Toronto Star, uh, they did a roundup of where uh, Canada's major banks think uh, prices might be headed. Um, I think they were asking them for their predictions for the end of this year and mid next year and uh, measuring it from, I think, uh, the March peak of this year. So uh, BMO came in predicting a 20% decline in prices by mid next year. TD uh, is saying a 19% decline in home prices by the end of this year. RBC is saying at least a 12% drop uh, by early next year. So um, given all of these people are making their predictions, do you guys want to record yours? <laughs> <laughs> you want to go first, John? <laughs> oh, man. I, I don't like making predictions. I mean, it's uh, obviously it's... it's uh... It's a fool's game, but listen, 20% is 100% realistic. I mean, I think Toronto is around 13-ish or so now, um, you know, and a lot of people get upset when we talk about averages because suburban homes have, have dropped more than 20%, which is fine. But the whole point is, I mean, you got to look at the aggregate statistics. So is there another 7% that comes off this fall? Very, very possible. I'm personally not as bearish as the people on Twitter seem to be. I mean, I, I feel like the Twitter space thinks that we're heading into like a like a five to 10 year real estate slump, you know, like this just this disastrous uh, slowdown. And I'm not I'm not quite as bearish. Like at the end of the day, like Toronto has like similar to what Steve said, 20 year low sales volumes. And we still only have two and a half months of inventory of low rise homes, right? And like the point of that is like, you don't need a ton more demands to enter the market to reach a balanced level of prices, right? So I don't know when that's gonna come when we see some stability, but probably maybe next year, but yeah, we can easily see another, you know, five to 7%, uh, you know, on an average by the end of this year, I would say. Boom. Steve? 
Oh, not, not a prediction. It's a, it's, you know, it's highly possible. I don't know. I don't know what to say. Uh, yeah, no. Caveat, I mean, I think, caveat, asterisk. Caveat, asterisk, asterisk yes. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. I think the one thing to put like the big asterisk here is like, so I'm reading like all these predictions. I'm seeing all these like charts and everybody commenting on Twitter telling me how much house prices are down. The one thing we have to like get some clarity on is like there's very everyone's posting different data metrics right so you have to understand is like you know where some of the people are saying well average house prices are down x since you know the february peak median sales prices are down this uh the, the banks are using forecasting using uh you know the the home price indexes which yes. are lagging smoothed out indicators so what happens is in a 20-year low of home sales where there's basically no liquidity very few homes are transacting and the composition of homes that are selling are changing, which means, hey, there's fewer single family houses being sold. There's more condos being sold, especially at the low end, because it's all people can afford these higher mortgage rates, that your average sales price is gonna look like it's collapsing. Mm -hmm. And so, but so that's not a perfect indicator because you know, you're know you using three or four months of data in an illiquid market where the composition is changing rapidly to figure out what the pricing is doing. And then the home price index, which is a smoothed out rolling index, which lags by like four to six months, that's not a very good indicator either. So I think what we have to kind of like strip away and say, okay, at the end of the day, all you can do is look at comparable sales. So it, unfortunately you kind of need sales history, a realtor to do it for you. But if you look at like the past sales of like, what was that neighbor's house selling for? And what is the new guy selling for in the same street, same house? I think on average in greater Vancouver, your typical detached house is down, I would say 12 to 15%, give or take. Um, That's not typical... as much as Toronto, man. That's like almost half of Toronto. We're down over 20% for low rise. Yeah. Is... So if you, but now again, if you go to the, if you go to the Fraser Valley, the suburbs, which is where most of your pandemic froth was, I mean, I'm going to say 15 to 20% is a pretty safe conservative number 20 percent of the more aggressive side you have to kind of find a motivated seller um and then you know your townhouse market same sort of thing down at least 15 percent um and, and you know inner city condos i'd say are down about five to eight percent so uh, as a whole i'm going to say as a whole the market's down you know if you want to take a broad brush and say 10 to 12 percent i think it's a fair estimation in greater vancouver uh, I think, I think you got to, I think maybe we're halfway there again. I don't know. It could be wrong, but another, another 10%, let's say, I mean, that's a 20, 20% correction, 25% correction. I mean, that probably would be one of your worst housing corrections, I think in the last couple of decades, mm -hmm. just for context. So uh, I know, you know, it's interesting because I'm reading like RBC's forecast. I don't know how much weight you guys put into this, but like, cause they were calling for, you know, a 12% decline. And I think they were using like the Terranet index, which again is even worse for like lagging indicators. They were saying a, you'd have peak to trough a 12% correction in the Terranet index. But during the financial crisis of 2008 to 2009, per that own index, they said national home prices declined by 9%, which to me seems a little bit conservative. So we're already at 6.7% from the peak right now. So per RBC, we're halfway through this market correction. And this market correction will be worse than 2008, 2009. But like yeah, when you, that... yeah. But when you tell people Sorry. 12%, they go, no way, it's already down 15% in Toronto and Vancouver. How can that be? And the problem is, is because we're using all these strange pricing metrics and there's no, you know, it's, it's difficult. Can, can certain pockets of, Vancouver or Toronto to, you know, I'm sure John can attest to this. Will certain pockets of detached houses in certain suburbs drop by 30%, mm -hmm. maybe more? I think that's, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think some already have in Toronto. Some are certainly probably yeah. down close to 30%. Yeah. So different, different areas, right? Like it's just different. But we were saying, well, how much will the all of greater Toronto across three, four different property types? combined like how much will they you know each 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 market's going to move slightly different yeah so actually i was really looking forward to asking you uh talking to you uh both about this because i'm noticing a bit of attention with some of the stuff i was reading so as you were saying steve the rbc when they uh, revised their housing forecast downwards they did note that the magnitude of the down 
turn that they are now predicting would rival that of the early 1990s in Ontario when resales fell 41% and prices 15%. So that speaks to what you're saying about the historical nature um, of, of these numbers that we're seeing. They are extremely notable. On the other hand, you know, going back to the Star article I was reviewing, it noted that even the most pessimistic predictions from the banks uh, wouldn't uh, um, erase altogether the gains that homeowners made during the COVID pandemic, uh, because they were noting that national house prices have risen 52% between March of 2020 and March of 2022 uh, of this year. So I'm wondering, you know, is it, is it, you know, with the takeaway that these massive drops in sales and prices may not be as catastrophic as, as we think, uh, in terms of the uh, the larger housing and economic impacts, because in in some of these were on paper gains, some many homeowners you know made a lot of these gains um, and are secured, or is it the type of this volatility that we're seeing, the way that it swings consumer behavior so wildly that makes it so um, damaging to housing and, and the economy itself? I mean, yeah, I mean, house prices in a lot of these suburban markets doubled in three years It's for certain products. So, you know, like, for example, I remember seeing uh, a colleague of mine sold a townhouse in, out in the suburbs in South Surrey for, you know, his client bought it just before the pandemic for 600K. They sold it in multiple offers at the top of the market for 1.2. Um, you know, cookie cutter townhouse, which they're making plenty more of them. And so now is the question is, is that townhouse really going to go from 1.2, which is an insanely ridiculous price that never should have sold for that. Uh, but that was the FOMO that we had and the liquidity that the, you know, the policymakers created. Is that going to really go down from 1.2 to 600K? I don't think so. I think there's certainly people on Twitter and, and out there online that, that believe it's going to go to 400K. That's not my view, but I think like can that townhouse that went from an artificial price from 600 to 1.2, come back down to, you know, 800,000, 850K, that would be a, a huge, huge decline. And I, and I think that, but I think that's very much in the realm of possibilities and realistic. Right now, that townhouse is probably about a million bucks. So, you know, if someone's lost 200K in equity if you bought the top of the market. So it's already a big decline, but yeah, it could go further. I just don't think we're going to erase these, a lot of these, you know, these gains and I think the one thing to put into context for everybody too, is at the end of the day, it's like, I know everyone's like, well, the policymakers, they're going to step aside because that's the right thing to do. And they're just going to let this thing go. And it just, at the end of the day, this is the bank's asset. This is the bank's collateral. And so in a highly levered economy and highly levered financial system, it, it, it becomes a, it becomes a banking problem. If you have these townhouses go from one, two back down to six, that's, that's the bank's collateral. Yeah. You know, it impairs bank lending further. And then, you know, we're talking about obviously more problem. Yeah. I mean, there's a certain, there's a certain point at which, you know, if they go too low, I mean, certainly you're going to see a little bit more stimulus kicked in to prevent that. But I mean, to Ermi, your point, like, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly part of the, part of the decline is going to be impacting, uh, you know, and, and this is one of the challenges with declining prices, like things like consumption, and, but for a lot of people, you're right, it was paper gains. You know, if you lived in your house for 20 years, I mean, you, you didn't notice that your townhome was now worth 1.2 million. You know, you bought it for 300 grand 15 years ago. So most people aren't going to be hit as hard because not everybody and certainly some households, you know, use this equity growth, refinance their home, take out a HELOC, do renovations, buy condo townhomes or buy pre-construction. Not everybody does that. A lot of people have no mortgage on their homes, right? So not everybody is rushing out, but certainly the decline is going to impact consumption a little bit. Higher mortgage rates are going to impact, you know, people's consumptions. And this is what's going to probably ultimately impact, uh, you know, and, and potentially lead to a recession. But kind of going back to the RBC's point about sort of the biggest drop since the 90s, I think the one thing that's, or a couple of big things that are different from today versus back then is in the 90s, a lot of pre-construction was built on spec. And what ended up happening is that when the market tanked, we were overbuilt. So there's a ton of inventory sitting there that needed to be absorbed. But also, 
at least in, the, in Ontario, we saw this massive immigration and non-resident boom, almost like we saw now. So population exploded, but then after prices tanked, it actually declined, right? Mm -hmm which is, mm -hmm. I think, the opposite of what's going to happen. Like, we're going to be at 400,000, sort of this immigration target for the next couple of years at least, which is going to be very supportive of the housing market. So that's kind of partly why I'm, I don't think we're going to go back to a 90s style housing decline. Like, certainly there's still more room for downward pressure, but I don't think it's going to be like a 10-year, um, you know, flattening of home prices. I think the other thing just to add to that, like everybody knows, like we agree, like these prices are needed to correct, mm -hmm. like for, for the health and the longevity of like every, like, this is, like it needed to correct. It's just always a matter of like, housing isn't a free market. Like it's just not. And as much as we all want it to be, or, or you know, it's just, it's just not. And I think housing is the, is the most subsidized market, financial market, um, I think there is. And, and, and again, right or wrong, it's just like politicians will obviously want to get reelected. And, and so I know like internally there are discussions of like, okay, like you have to think of, if you're a policymaker, like what's like, let's think this through and let's just say mortgage rates stay here at 5%. Maybe they go to 6%. They stay here at 6%. Um, people go to renew their mortgages. The rates have now doubled. People are getting trigger rated all over the place. The economy is in a deep recession. Uh, what, like, what, are you, what are you doing as a, as a policymaker? Like, I, I think the obvious answer is to say, okay, well, listen, we can't necessarily control interest rates. So maybe they're still at 5%. What's preventing them from saying, hey, you know what? Let's, you know, you got trigger rated. You didn't pay off any principal during your term. Why can't you extend that to 35 years? You can change that policy tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so I know, like, I, I think it's actively being discussed behind closed doors. I don't think it's imminent, but if I'm a policymaker, that's, that's a pretty obvious thing to do. And I'm just trying to think as a, as a policymaker um, in terms of what they would and probably will do in that circumstance. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And I would not be surprised if they're thinking about that or planning that some kind of policy like extending amortizations, loosening stress tests, stuff like that. Uh, if things don't go well and people can't afford high rates and the high rates are with us for a while. By the way, the UK, England just uh, England just removed their mortgage stress test, which has been in place since 2014. And they had as big of a dip in prices as us, which is interesting, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, and I would not be surprised if we see something like that in Canada. Excellent. That was actually the question I wanted to talk to you guys <laughs> about. And you've taken it, it us through. Um, uh, really, you know, what measures could you see our government introducing uh, to try and stimulate uh, the housing? But I think you've mentioned uh, a number of them there. Um, and uh, Steve, we're going to throw up your tweet there that's uh, about the UK there. Last last time we were talking about their uh, their amortization maybe increasing up to 50 years. Uh, now they have uh, scrapped their mortgage stress test policy completely. So uh, obviously some attempts happening. To be frank, I don't even think it's as irrational as some people think to ease the stress test. Like part of the reason why they put it in is because rates were plummeting, right? And they didn't want people borrowing, assuming a 2% mortgage, right? Because it allows them to take on way more debt. You know, and one of the measures the Bank of Canada is concerned about is people's debts to income. And if obviously rates are plummeting, you can borrow far more relative to your income. So part of it was to constrain that. If rates are at 5%, do you need a 2% stress test? It's debatable, right? Uh, so I don't even think from a policy perspective, it's as, as crazy as it sounds. But I, I, And I do think that they may consider it if, if things stay sluggish. Yeah, I think like it's, yeah, I always think, I always said that that stress test was brought in just to curb credit growth. I mean, if you listen to any of Sadal, Evan Sadal's comments back in the day when it was brought in, it was like, they just wanted to slow the growth of credit, to slow the pace of house prices accelerating. That's what it was designed for. It wasn't necessarily designed as like this grand buffer, but, you know, I always go back to like, just governments and policymakers, are, they're so predictable. And like, you know, Australia is dealing with a lot of the similar same problems that we are. And Remember, they brought in they brought in basically um, a curb on credit uh, growth uh, from from bank lending. I think back in same, similar time around the stress test, their housing market literally rolled over. Prices dropped, I think, ten percent, and they pulled the plug on that policy. 
and got and got rid of it. So it's like I'm not saying that anything is imminent. I'm not saying that if they remove the stress test, prices are going up 20% tomorrow. I think it's still possible. Prices can still continue to decline. They can flatline for several years. Um, but I just think it's naive to think that policymakers are going to go like this, put their hands up in the air if house prices nationally are down 25, 30%, and they're just going to go like this. I think that right now, again, per the, per the national home price index, we're down about 7%. Uh, from the highs and it, it, it's just a matter of like what's what's an acceptable rate of decline I mean it, it, John you had um, who was that policymaker that you had on your show the the Toronto guy or the Ontario Toronto guy that basically he just left Adam the Toronto guy oh, <laughs> Adam Vaughn oh Adam Vaughn no. yeah like wasn't it wasn't he going on like oh what are we gonna do let prices fall 10 percent like oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> like yeah, I don't he, know what he was saying. To avoid even a ten percent decline in prices, exactly. Yeah, the ten percent to me is healthy. 10, 15 yeah. percent, and then sort of once you get over there, I think people start to sweat. But again, not to say that you guys can control markets and pricing, but to think yeah. they'll just sort of sit by idly, I think, is is naive. Awesome. So that takes us to consumer questions. Uh, sorry, our viewer questions quite nicely. Um, I'm going to start with one and and first, John, I think it would be helpful if you could uh, unpack a bit uh, and then answer the question. So um, from at Ralston 727, what is the average trigger rate? Now, first, John, could you just explain um, the trigger rate uh, concerns that people have for variable mortgages and what that means? And then, um, Steve, I think you actually recently uh, talked about some interesting predictions around those trigger rates. So yeah, I mean, the trigger rate really impacts people with variable rate mortgages who have fixed payments, whose payments do not change as the interest rate increases. And what happens is if your payment's not changing, but your interest rate's increasing, more of your payment's going towards interest and principal. And at some point, you're no longer even paying down your mortgage, right? And it's around that point that banks turn around and say, well, you've hit this trigger rate, we have to now increase your mortgage payment. Now, if you have a variable rate mortgage with Scotiabank, it's one of the few banks where uh, people who have variable rates have seen their mortgage payment actually increase over the past six months, the other banks haven't. So a lot of people are worried if I have a variable rate mortgage, at what point am I actually gonna see my interest rate uh, increase? And I don't know, maybe Steve, I'll let Steve pick it up from there. Yeah, um, I just, I've, I'm in a certain situation myself, so I'm I'm actually kind of watching it closely, which is, you know, I just had a chat with, with my broker at RBC. So I think I've talked about this before. I had, uh, I picked up a rate near the lows at 1.2%. And I think my trigger rate on my thing was 3.95. And so what happens is, uh, assuming the banking account raises rates by 50 basis points in September, which again, I think is going to happen, that would officially like trigger my mortgage. And so I said, well, what does that look like? What does it, you know, you walk me through it. And so what happens is basically RBC was saying, well, we'd ask you to increase your payment. Um, we want you to pay at least $2 of principal. So effectively what they're saying is like, we'll, we'll increase your monthly payment by $2. So that was RBC's policy. Each bank is going to have a different policy, but that makes RBC compliant because Aussie, doesn't want interest only mortgages, obviously. So as long as you're paying $2 of principal, you're good. Obviously that's not the, 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 obviously the best solution for most people. And so what typically, she, you know, she was saying is basically most people are calling in and increasing their payment on their mortgage. Maybe it's a hundred dollars a month, maybe it's three, $400, whatever you want to do, but that increases your trigger rate. So for example, I increased my payment um, by I think a hundred dollars a month. And that pushed my trigger rate from 3.95 to, I believe, 4.10, just by increasing at $100. So there's a lot. And then, you know, or you can do lump sum payments and pay it down, get your amortization schedule back down. So long story short is I think like a national bank had a chart on it, obviously, that uh, I think their numbers are a little bit off. They're, per their assumptions, like even if you bought it near the lows of rates in 2021 Q4, that the bulk of mortgages... Uh, would not have trigger rates this year. And especially if you got a variable, you know, a couple of years ago, a variable at let's say two, two and a half percent, you're not going to get triggered. But I think the, the biggest concern is in five years when you go to renew or in three or four years when you go to renew your mortgage, if there's been very little principal that's actually been paid down over that term, 
that's when you're going to see the big in the, the big increase jump in your payments um, because you have to get the whole chunk of the mortgage um, fit under the remaining amortization schedule. So let's say you initially started the 25 year amortization. Now you have 20 years left on the amortization, but you have to fit that whole payment under 20 years. So yes, you can refinance and bring it back to 25 years, but it requires you to then requalify, yeah. which is a question mark of, do you have the incomes and the debts and whatnot in line to be able to requalify? at higher rates, which I think some people certainly won't be able to. So, uh, yeah, and uh, that actually leads us to uh, nicely to the next question uh, from a viewer from at Aaron at Engage. What is your estimation of the long-term neutral mortgage rate, in, in quotes? Assumes today's prices and stress tests, um, stress tests, and it would be an effective borrowing rate that would be neither too stimulative or too dampening. This is maybe the Goldilocks rate. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so what would that be? That is a good question. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think there is one, quite frankly. I, I, think, I think there is in the short term, but I think markets adjust, right? So I think, um, you know, if you say three and a half percent is the neutral rate where, you know, we don't stimulate the housing market too much. Well, that's going to happen for a couple of years. And then eventually, as markets adjust to this slightly higher rate, you're going to see a boom in demand again. Like, it's just kind of normal. If you think about what happened, actually, even when they introduced the stress test, at least in Toronto, I can't speak for Vancouver, demand dipped, prices leveled. It seemed like a calm, beautiful, normal market, you know, not crazy bidding wars. Prices were rising maybe three, four, five percent. It seemed balanced. And then, Fast forward a couple of years, by the end of 2019, we saw this huge surge in demand again because the market had adjusted to the stress test, right? Everybody and, found a cosigner. Like, exactly, exactly. And at the end of the day, like you cannot, you know, the, the demand for housing is not just about stress tests. We're, our population's growing faster than our ability to build homes. There's too many people fighting for too few homes. So you can't get away from that. So I don't think there's a long-term interest rate that is that's going to be neutral I, I don't think we can avoid sort of the, the the market that we're in right now i think that's a that's a well thought out answer that's kind of similar to what my thoughts would be as well i i, I still think i'd say probably today because it's always a question of like well what is like you know for example like what is inflation right i mean if inflation's at 10 percent <laughs> you know is it the neutral rate on your mortgage you know three yeah, i mean that seems maybe stimulative to me right so i still think like in this environment like again we saw when rates got to three and a half percent in 2018 housing market rolled over 20 year low in home sales in greater vancouver 10 year low in the gta um i'm gonna say the neutral like john it's a bit of a moving target but i'd say today i think it's probably around three percent in the low threes i yeah. think is, is it's probably where you're seeing very little to no growth in house prices, but probably, you know, reasonable amount of home sales and a, probably a flat housing market. So I think that's probably in the low threes today. All right, I'm gonna hold you to those numbers. <laughs> <laughs> um, our next question is from at Radiv Sis. And uh, it goes back to this question that investors, uh, John, that you, uh, you were tweeting about earlier. Um, but uh, this is on, on a national basis. Uh, according to this article, home investors were responsible for the bubble in home prices in 2021. Under what conditions would home investors sell their third and fourth homes? So if these are the people that were behind the run-up, what's the chances that they would be behind uh, yeah, a massive exit? Yeah, that's a good question because, I mean, in theory, you know, once you know, when they're refinancing those investment properties and they have to pay higher mortgage payments, I mean, potentially, um, but again, rates, rates, uh, not rates, rents have increased significantly in Toronto and we're not seeing a ton of distress from investors right now. Most are holding on. I think most are actually pretty bullish, quite frankly, which is why we haven't seen a surge of listings. And part of the bullishness is just you know, rents exploding, right? I think people see this dip as short term. So, you know, I, I think that people who are extremely leveraged, you know, who have 
he locks maxed out a ton of debt on their properties, maybe went to private lenders and are paying, are going to end up paying 6% on their mortgage. Yeah, they might sell, but I think they're uh, in the minority personally. So I don't know. I and think, Steve, yeah, I don't see. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I've, uh, yeah, I think it's always like a minority of, of people, right, John? It's like, the there's, I think everyone just like broad strokes, like, again, like I love Twitter. I spend way too much time on there, but like, everybody just assumes like every Canadian's like highly levered and like everyone's going to lose their homes. That's like, you know, as like you said, I mean, what, I don't know what the research is. Like, what is it? How many with 30, 40% of Canadians don't have a mortgage on their home? It's like 50 that don't have a, I think it's something very high. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, so anyways, it's a low, it's a low number, but like there's, then as you get the certain amount of like, I've had phone calls in the last, you know, couple of weeks, month, you know, people call me some, a lot of times they're actually from the GTA. Hey, I've got this, Call investment condo and you know <clears throat> i was losing 200 dollars a month and but you know i was on a whatever scotia bank variable mortgage and now my payment now i'm losing 400 a month because the interest rate's gone up try to sell take a loss and, and move on and i'm you know what i mean so i think there's, there's definitely like an element of those people at similar times like yeah the, the people that got the private loan because maybe they're speculating in the market and assuming like hoping that they could re refinance in a year or sell it for a year for a profit that are going to get stuck because their rates have doubled. So I think there's an element of that, or again, even like pre-sale people that, that bought with the intention of closing, Yeah. maybe they didn't secure their rate. And all of a sudden, well, they said, well, when I bought my pre-sale 18 months ago, the rate was 2%. Now it's five. I can't even qualify for this loan because I got to get stress tested at 7%. Mm -hmm. Those are the people I think that, that, again are like a forced seller where their product has to come to market but i think there's a lot of people and i'm seeing it there's a lot of people that are just saying you know what I'm, I'm not able to sell i'm tired of this let's take it off the market and we're seeing uh, a lot of delistings and people that literally just some of them won't come back to market mm -hmm. and steve we were getting some questions given the importance of uh, foreign investment in the vancouver area um around whether you think specifically foreign investors are there any conditions uh, that might see them uh, pull out? Uh, it's hard. I don't really track that market too closely. It's not really like my clientele. Uh, anecdotally, like you know, obviously, you know, I'm in constant communication with the realtors that do work with those clientele. I, I don't think there's a whole lot going on there. It's kind of just a weird, slow, quiet market. I always say like, if you kind of want to get an idea of like what's happening with like foreign money, I always just say, look at the high end luxury pre-sale condos in the, in the downtown core. So I'm talking mm. any luxury tower downtown Vancouver. Now most pre-sales, a lot of them are launching 24, 25, $2,800 a square foot. There's not a very strong local market at those prices. And so that market has been really slow and stagnant for the last four to five years um, since the foreign taxes, since the repatriation of capital back to China. So that's kind of my view is that market's still really weak. And so I just don't think there's a lot, there's just not much happening from the foreign foreign side of things. Mm, that's interesting. Um, all right, I, I think we're, we're getting to uh, over our time, but we have so many good questions. Um, I'm, Going to maybe skip ahead. Maybe I'll ask one last question and save a few of these others for next time. If, if that sounds good. Um, from at Peter of record, with rents rising at a record clip and prices down, does this present a potential floor in prices moving forward? Dot dot dot. He says probably not. What do you guys think? <laughs> uh I mean, I, I don't know if it necessarily presents a floor, but I think it. it I mean, I think it's helped it's going to support a floor. Like I said, at the end of the day, one of the trends we're seeing certainly is people, I mean, and Steve kind of touched on this, investors listen to property to sell, can't sell it, aren't getting the price and are basically saying, you know what, just take it off, I'm going to rent it, right? And in many ways, that is in some ways providing some stability or, or reducing the decline in prices when people are not as motivated to sell. And the fact that we have a very strong rental market, people are optimistic. I do think in some ways it is 
um, it is contributing to kind of like the, it's preventing kind of prices from falling even further. I think both in the low rise and even in the condo, ma condo market as well. So I don't think it's going to avoid, you know, we're not going to avoid potential future declines, but I think it is supportive in many ways of, of kind of keeping a little bit of stability in the market. Yeah, I think it's keeping the, um, you know, the, the, a lot of these investors we just talked about, right? Like if you're facing higher interest rate costs and higher, higher mortgage payments as a result, like the, the, the only benefit to that is that you are having higher rents which are helping to offset a lot of your carrying costs. So that might prevent some of these investors from hitting the panic button and having to sell because they're getting a higher rent to sort of keep them afloat. Um, I'd be curious to see how the rental market you know, progresses from here. It's, it's always a tough one. Like everybody thinks they have the answer, but it's always a tough one to figure out like, okay, we know what's happening right now, John, which is a housing starts are, are hitting a wall. Like th th these projects are no longer feasible given the, the increase in, in financing costs and, and the weakening resale market. And so those, a lot of them are pulling back. You still have uh, record immigration uh, in Q1 and Q2 uh, for our good friend, Ben Rabideau there. And so, but now how much of the softening of the labor market moving forward, right? I mean, if we continue to get these higher interest rates, the economy slows down, we enter that recession, you know, does the wage growth sort of pull back and, and people start losing jobs? Does that start to impair the rental market a bit or at least keep rents from rising further? So it's always a tough one to sort of balance. But I think as a whole, I think that the fact that we do have a very tight rental market kind of indicates to me that we're probably still not oversupplied mm -hmm. and that's going to help some investors not all but it's going to help some investors from being forced liquidations actually i think that touches uh, nicely on at katie 44 121's question uh which is uh will we eventually see downtown condo prices drop like house prices have and I'm, I'm sensing from what you're saying that, you know, as long as there are these other avenues of, of rent, uh, being able to rent out units, maybe not. But if that changes, what do you guys think? Yeah, the interesting thing with Toronto is inventory is actually rising a lot more rapidly for condominiums and prices are not, right? And to me, I think this speaks to maybe an investors who are not as eager to sell are more patient. And if they don't sell, they'll just rent it out. So I do think we're probably still have potential for downward pressure. Uh, but again, if we consider the fact that the, the like probably easily 50% of condos are owned by investors, you know, a lot of it's going to depend on what they do and how motivated they are. And certainly the, the tight rental market has been very supportive of people just kind of holding on to their properties. Yeah, the downtown market, like if you go look at the average price per square foot for a resale condo in downtown Vancouver, I mean, it's tracked sideways. Like, yeah, it had a little bit up, then it came down and went back. It's, ba it's basically tracked sideways for the last five years. So more or less, like if you bought a downtown condo in 2017, it's essentially been dead money for the past five years. So I don't know. I'm not necessarily convinced there's a whole lot of froth there. And now when you say, again, suburban homes have doubled in two and a half years, that makes me a lot more nervous. And I think that's where we see that correction getting back to the earlier part of the show, which is like how much are house prices going to decline? Well, like, yeah, I think they, you know, again, I'm just a lot less concerned about certain segments of the market. And I think, you know, we're certainly seeing more, more people getting back to, to the work, at least in a hybrid model. And so I think that you're certainly seeing, you know, the downtown rental market. Uh, and I mean, the rents are up tremendously. And um, so, I mean, that, that's pretty much all I have to say there. All right. Well, we've gone over time and uh, there's more questions, but I think we'll uh, we'll maybe hold it here and get back to some of these others. Please keep your questions coming. I thank everybody for watching and thank you, John and Steve, for your insights as always. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. It was fun.